In your new book, I have a copy here, you have a copy here, The Rise and Fall of Nations, you outline 10 factors that identify winners and losers in the global economy. One of those in winners, in your opinion, is India, despite its shortcomings. One of the potential losers is China. So let's go through those. Why is it that you think India may have a bright future? Right. I think, you know, my line about India has been that it has consistently disappointed the optimists and the pessimists. That's the history <laughs> of India. Right. And I think that the good thing is that the expectations about India have been reset now. So the hype about India, which was there, has really been deflated a lot. Even Modi coming to power, you know, there was a lot of hype about that. Now there's a lot of realism. So one of the rules I have out there is that um, is the hype watch, that for countries that are too hyped up, be a bit cautious of the countries which people are ignoring. Those are the countries where you're likely to sort of uh, be rewarded going forward in the next five years or so. So that's one of the rules that I speak about on in India. But the other like, issue about India, which I feel is, uh, you know, which is uh, fine, is the fact that in India, the, uh, the problems are just not as acute in, in other parts of the world. So it's a bit of a relative game as well. And the fact that the rest of the region, South Asia, is beginning to do better. So even the other countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and I dare say Pakistan, those countries are beginning to do better, and that should help the region well, as such. To go into your 10 principles just yeah. a little bit here. Yeah. So India, the population is growing. That's, that's good under yes, one of your right. principles, right? The, demographic. Um, uh, the location, as you said, the geography, being able yeah. to take advantage of its location. On the other hand, a political reform, the importance of political reform, Prime Minister Modi came in, wanted to reform, hasn't worked out yet the way he expects to, and also government regulation. There's a lot of government regulation in India. Yeah, there's a lot of state meddling which happens in India, uh, yeah. and you know, like, so the entire chapter on perils of state, in fact, is very focused on that. But I feel that uh, it is somewhat reducing, uh, you know, so like, like, this is all about change. Like all these 10 rules focus on change. If you look at the absolute snapshot, it would be very difficult to. And in today's environment, you have to remember one thing more, which is that there's no country in the world which will score well on all the 10 rules. Right. Sure, There's sure. not one country today which will well, score well on all the rules. Well, when you say it's improving, you should tell that to Apple and Tim Cook right now, <laughs> right, who can't get their stores into India because of government regulation, because they have to have local ownership. There are lots of problems in India. But the thing about India is that the base is so low. And, uh, you know, like in terms of their, their per capita income is only $2,000. Whereas China now has become a truly middle income country. And the, and the problems China faces are very different compared to India does at such a low base. Well, one of the other items on your 10 point list of rise and fall of nations is uh, the good billionaire, which I uh, love that term. Right. Explain it. Uh, China actually does better on the billionaire front than, than India, uh, maybe not by much. But yeah. what's, what's good about billionaires? Yeah, you know, like I have an entire chapter there focused on income inequality. I think this has really become the hot issue across the world. And my entire point there is when does income inequality become such an issue that it begins to affect the economic reforms in a country where the population you know, has a backlash against wealth creation because they think all the wealth being created is sort of uh, like only benefiting a few people or a few bad billionaires. So the entire chapter about good billionaires, bad billionaires really sort of looks at the list of billionaires in a country and uh, tries to assess what does that tell you about a country. And in, and in uh, India's case, in fact, uh, if you look at what was happening last decade, all the billionaires who were rising uh, were either people who had uh, merely inherited their wealth or billionaires in corruption-prone industries such as real estate, mining, commodities. That's now changing a bit this decade. But in China's case, a lot of the rise of the billionaires has been concentrated in, in the good industry, such as tech. So that's you know? a positive factor for China. Yeah, that's, so why that's are one you positive. so skeptical about China's future? On my most important rule, the kiss of debt. Uh, debt. Which is, yes, on debt. That every single economic miracle in history has ended when a country has accumulated too much debt over a short span of time, which is when the debt increases very rapidly. And what China has seen since 2009 is that no other developing country in history has accumulated as much debt as China has done uh, in the last few years. And there's one statistic which tells all. Today, it takes six dollars of debt to create a dollar of growth in China. At the peak of the U.S. housing bubble in 2008, it took three dollars of debt to create a dollar of uh, growth in China. So they're buying uh, growth. In, in they're, the United States. They're buying growth with debt, is what you're Massive saying. Massive amounts of and debt. And it's getting more expensive. And it's not a very good bargain. That's right. And this is not how China used to be. Like, until 2008, China's debt ratios were relatively stable. This is a change in China's story in the last few years. And that's why I've gone from being really bullish about China last decade yeah. to now being much less optimistic okay, we, about it.